Music's about emotion, about feelings, not about the technicality of it. It's in that emotion, or it's making you dance, or it's doing what it's setting out to do, then usually that's the right place with it. I bought you breakfast, then you started your rings. The air was fragrant and thick with our silence. My breath is something deep inside pinched I touched the bump on your wrist you were born with Like with all of Arlo's stuff, it's about the lyrics and the, the voice being forefront with everything so that's the key thing in mixing it, it's all about the voice Watching you trying to push away It hurts when you see it come and never use your words to show you can This track was the very last track to come in on the album and was sounding good straight away. Like it was a mix that needed massive salvaging work. Too cool to show it, baby, so good, you're too good to be true. Hello, I'm David Wrench. Um, welcome to Mix with the Masters. Today we'll be, be looking at my mix of the Arlo Parks track, Too Good, and we'll be breaking it down to its elements, looking about getting various elements of space into the track, getting the vocal to sit in there, and then maybe looking at the, um, what's going on on the master bus. We'll talk a bit about volume and handing mixes in to mastering and listening copies into a label, and we'll just talk about the general approach to, to mixing that I'm using in my new studio here, um, which is usually within the box. I've been now for two years. The studio I was in before this was in more of a block of different studios, but because of that I could hear some other people's sub bass just bleeding enough through the walls that it was disturbing me. My ears are so sensitive it was driving me crazy, so I had to get out of there. And so I got this place built and it took a while, took a couple of months. It's a big um, unit in a, a block with lots of different units and really went for it with the soundproofing so it's a room within a, well there's two rooms there's a this uh, control room then there's also a live room through the window there it's all rooms within rooms so we did quite a bit of construction work um, the floor is raised and floated the ceiling is is suspended down at a slight angle there's one wall is fully padded at the back and then there's various uh, ceiling work to, to stop reflections from there. Luckily, because this is the fourth place I've moved to, I had quite a bit of experience on how I'd want it to sound. So it was quite quick once I was in to get the, the sound right for mixing. Um, just had to do a little bit of work of damping on the, towards the back of the room because I was hearing a bit too many reflections there. The live room luckily sounded pretty good straight away and then I moved all my records in there onto two walls which acted as really good damping around where the drums are and it takes a while I always find it takes like about a year from being in a room before you can really settle into where the right spots are for things especially for recording maybe you can get like the control room sounding good quite quickly but it takes quite a bit of experimentation to find where the best place for drums is where where the guitar amps sound good where is the best place to record vocals um, but I think we're there now. Um, I've done sessions here with a full live band and I've done produced a uh, few albums here and it's a nice environment to work in and it's definitely quiet from outside noise, which is a big bonus. I'm still using the same speakers um, that I was, that I've been using for years. So it's a pair of Neumann KH310As and a big Neumann sub that I'm almost sat on, it's right under the desk here, right by where my knees are, because I really like to feel the sub when I'm mixing. And then my alternative speakers are these uh, Unity Audio Rock 2s. Um, and I'll occasionally use some um, Audisy headphones um, to check mixes as well. And then my little pure radio that's down here. So that's, yeah, that's my, but mainly it's the Neumanns. That, that's, they're my main setup. I'm about to have um, an Atmos system put in but that'll be built around the, the Unities and some Neumanns up in, smaller Neumanns up in the ceiling. But I've used the Neumanns for years, I just find they're really um, accurate, especially for more electronic music. And paired with the sub, 
I, I know I can trust what's happening in the low end, and I'm really confident about it. Actually, this is the best room I've had them sound in because I've, when you sit here, the stereo image is really spot on. It's really, it, it, there's an amazing separation and distance. I found that you have to angle them in slightly for them to sound right. They don't sound great when they're straight on. Um, angling them in really opens up the stereo image and makes it really um, correct and much easier to space things out and get the mixes right. I generally mix in the box. Um, it's rare that I'll go out into a desk, and I wouldn't do that in this room anyway. I'd go to a different room. But these days, with, with what's needed for recalls and stems, working in the box is the only way that makes um, sense time-wise for me. Plus, once I did some tests, I couldn't really hear much different. I wasn't gaining much from going through. I wasn't gaining anything, actually, from going through a desk. It was, in fact, in blind tests, I preferred stuff that was mixed in the box. It had slightly more clarity to it. But if I do want to go out through analog gear, I might run some stuff out through a channel here or um, or through a compressor or, or more likely something like one of my space echoes or um, spring reverbs. I just record it back in. And sometimes I'll run vocals through tape. So I've got like a half inch tape there in the corner, but only if only if needed. Sometimes it doesn't really work. Sometimes it does. There's certain artists, it's something they're really insistent upon. Um, but in general, 95% like of the time I'm in the box. So um, with Arlo Parks, um, she was on the label called Transgressive. So I've known, um, I've known that label for a long time. They have other artists on there, like Let's Eat Grandma, who are a duo. Um, and I've produced two albums with them now, uh, including the new one that's just about to come up, which we did here. Um, well, we started that before lockdown, and whenever there was gaps where we could work, we managed to finish that off during then. And Marika Hackman, who was managed by them, I uh, produced her album in my previous two studios. So I've known that label for a while, and they, when they signed Ala Parks, they asked if I'd be up for mixing her stuff. And obviously, as soon as I listened to it, I thought she was brilliant. There were two tracks done initially in the lead up to the album. And then just over a year ago, the, the whole bulk of the rest of the album came in. I think they were still in and out of lockdown at that point. So there were no attended sessions. I was just working on it on my own. The majority of the album was produced by Gianluca, who I'd worked with, with before on a Taishi album. Uh, which we mixed out in the States. But this track was the very last track to come in on the album and was uh, produced by Paul Epworth and recorded in his amazing church studio. So we'll delve in and have a have a look. It was one thing to say is it was sounding good straight away. Um, as soon as I pulled it up, it wasn't like it was a mix that needed massive salvaging work. It just needed to open out a bit, punch a bit more, definitely sound better on the radio. And we need to just get a, the drums to sort of hit in a really sort of punch through, but not to dominate. So yeah, at the top here, we've got various drums. There's the main beat that goes through the whole track. There's a um, this percussion that comes in for the second half of the track. Um, there's a bit more percussion here with like hats. There's a sub bass which just sort of seems to come in on the bars from the first chorus onwards. There's a there's a bass, and then you've got various guitars, um, and then various keyboards and some strings, and then you've got the main vocal, and then there's quite a lot of different backing vocals. So there's doubles that come in, and then there's a chorus vocal and various interjections of vocals and um, some effects here down the bottom. So it's not like a super complex arrangement. There's not millions of things going on. Like with all of Aula's stuff, it's about the lyrics and the, the voice being forefront with everything. So that's the key thing when mixing it. It's all about the voice. It's all about the lyrics. And it's about making sure that they're super clear, even if you want the track to really punch and hit hard. 
the voice has got to really come through and the lyrics have got to be really clear. It's because that's what it's all about. When it arrived, it was as a Pro Tools session, but they, um, it was without plugins. I think I may have kept like one plugin or something somewhere, um, but I stripped it right back. I think they'd rendered this one down, which was uh, some delays that come in on the vocal. But other than that, it's pretty much a stem session, really. So if we listen a bit to the rough mix. And this is the actual mix. So it just opens out a bit, it's a bit brighter. It's, it's fairly subtle, so I'm not trying to change any levels drastically, but it also needed to just sound clearer and open. And the, the place where that really showed up was when I listened on the little speakers. It was about getting that vocal to really cut through and to get it to hit on the sort of radio speakers. So we're just going to listen into the to the drums as a group here. So this is all the three tracks together. Okay, so on this you can see I've really boosted the low end. So once, it's just to get that, that kick to really cut through and not just be about the top end, but to feel the weight of it, which I can feel under the sub here, which I wasn't getting before. And then we've pushed a bit around here just that to get that to cut through a little bit more as well. But this is the main frequency that we've boosted. So that's, that's the real thud from the kick. Also we've done... So this is, obviously I'm letting the kick come through here. I'm not doing anything with that, with the, with the multiband compressor. But we're just holding in the holding in the snare because it was it felt like the snare was leaping out too much of the track it was dominating everything it felt too heavy against the kick so so with that we got the snare then tucked in there a bit more with these so it's like a fast a fast attack and if we take that off here that the snare is much louder than the, than the kick and if we go back to the fully dry so we've tamed, we've tamed it a bit but we've also given it a bit more thump and then when we add in this we haven't done much just rolled a bit of rumble off it and boosted a little bit here for clarity and then a little bit of body in the hat as well. This is that little rhythm that's going on there, so just brought that out a, a touch more. And then here we have this um, sort of affected snare. This is really sort of thinned out. And again, not much, just boosted a bit at the mid of that, just to accentuate what it's doing a bit more. And that's just giving a groove, adding a bit of shuffle and groove into, into that main track. What we've also got here is in the choruses, we've got the, um, the hat. Oh, it's like a shaker. That's, so we've just got a shaker here that's just accenting and adding in with the groove there and it's balancing out what's happening on the other side so that's slightly panned over that way so you've got the a bit of a stereo spread on the drums and then you hear this bit on its own when it drops and then towards the end to pick it up from the middle eight onwards you've got you've got the um got like cowbell which we kept really dry here, which I'd normally put like a tiny bit of reverb on the cowbell, but I think because there's, as you'll see now, this comes in at the same time as claps, which have quite a bit of reverb on, I've kept the cowbell quite dry and not really compressed it much either. So it's got its dynamic um, kept in there with it. And then there's quite a few tracks of claps layered up. 
the overall effect is. So if we listen to them on their own. So you've got all sorts of different layers of claps here. So we'll go through this because it can often be hard to get one good clap sound. I often find it, it involves you've got this stereo clap, which is very roomy. We've got a like a really flaming clap there. We've got a more distant clap. And then we've got these three added in as well. They run through a bus. Again, okay, we just push the middle of them and the very top a little bit. But it's this frequency you want with the claps. It's this. It's that bit that cuts through the middle of the mix. And then we've used the UAD Ocean where it's to give a nice spacey room sound to it. I think I tried a few things on this, but that felt best. I just wanted like a natural room. So when we, because without, and then we got, there's a little bit of room and we wanted to add in. I'm guessing the room that's already on there is, is the room in, um, in the church. So it's, 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 so you've got different already just with the drum track you can hear you've got different um, depth to things which I try and aim for in a mix really. So you've got some dry elements there that are punching through that are very dead and dry and not roomy. Then you've got some few bits of things in the mid range and then you've got some stuff that's placed further back. So that all together you've then got this space all filled. You've got like a depth to it. You've got the claps which are further back. You've got the the kick and snare hitting. But then you've also got some some sort of mid-range stuff with the hats and, and percussion stuff. So it's all sort of layered there in a in a way where it takes up that's already got a bit of a, a 3D image on it. So when you listen together. And then the next thing that comes in is this sub. It just comes in every Actually, it's just roll because it's got nothing else above here. We just roll that off, and it's literally that. And you just see it's all just very hitting the root note of every bar, and it's just giving it weight. It's almost just accenting that kick. But and then bringing the actual bass. Again, boosted more low end on this, and then giving it some compression with the. This is my favourite for bass and vocals usually, depending on the vocalist. But because um, it's quite transparent, I've got a real one down there that I use as well when I'm when I'm tracking stuff. It just feels quite transparent, but it really does the job and brings like clarity and presence into things. And I nearly always have a multiband compressor on the bass so it can control the low end, control the pickiness of it, control the body of the bass, control all those three things separately. If the there hadn't have been this sub bass that comes in on the heads of the bars I'd have probably tried to artificially add a little bit of sub into that bass but because that's there it doesn't need it it would just clash with it. But, um, So that's that's then your main groove, um, and the bass is quite dry, quite up, quite up front, it's quite melodic. It's, it's driving it quite a bit. Probably the next thing to talk about. So in the verses, it's 
is this little offbeat guitar. It's sort of syncopated, it's not really offbeat. Like a syncopated guitar rhythm. So there's three mics on the guitar. Um, there's a DI, a dynamic and a ribbon, which is obviously all on the same, on the same amp. So I'm not actually using the DI, um, but it's always handy when you're recording. If, especially if you're not like 100% sure you're going to stick with the sound, it's good to have a DI of guitar and, and bass because you can always then reamp with a slightly different sound. You can change the you can change the amp, you can change the guitar effects pedal. The first thing I did actually once we were allowed to have people back in the studio here was an album with Kelly from Block Party, and that was pretty much all him and guitar um, and yeah we di'd everything and then occasionally we'd spin it back out through amps to reamp with a slightly different sound even if it's just to thicken the sound that's already there but it was quite invaluable having that but here we've just used the especially for the verses this main verse sound we've kept the guitar quite mono and central we haven't tried to sort of artificially widen it so we've got the drums have got their their stereo image and as we'll see we've got We've got some keyboards that are quite stereo. I think we wanted to keep the guitar pretty much there, but with a little bit of a little bit of reverb. So dry. So that's like super dry sound. Then this is the first thing to go on them because we wanted to make them sound almost like an old sample. Grit them up a bit. It will sound like they're coming off an old soul record or something. So they they go through the RC20 retro color, which is brilliant at what it does. Um, they're grunging things up and adding a bit of vintage sound things. There's like a little bit of little bit of vinyl crackle, a little bit of wow and flutter, and a little bit of uh, harmonic distortion, and a little bit of like tapiness to it. It's just to all modulate it slightly and just mess it up a little bit, not be too clean. And then we're using the, uh, well it's called Galaxy, but it's obviously um, a Space Echo uh, simulation from UAD. And we've got some of the spring reverb from that. And that's all also sort of mono and central. And this is what's really adding in, is the, the Sound Toys Decapitator is really saturating it and making it clip. It's clipping and it's clipping the reverb as well. And then just being held in a little bit by the... Um, just having the sort of peaks held in by the multiband. So that's the, that's the verse guitar. Let me load that in with everything else. So, already you can sort of see it's... Um, the mix compressor is still on at the moment, but it's starting to sound more like an... It's starting to sound like an old record. It's got that sort of 60s groove feel, but with the modern low end added into it. Then the next guitar, it's a similar thing. We've got, we've got the DI, which we're not using. And then we've got um, the dynamic and a ribbon. And this is the, this is the main chorus guitar, oh, which is doing a very similar part, really. So we've added more spring reverb in. And here we're compressing it as a whole a bit more, because it's going to punch through in the chorus. There's more so when you listen, so this has got a, this is a little bit more open, and then it's, and then it's now the details brought up a bit more with that little bit more compression. So it's a similar, similar chain, but it's just driving a touch more. Okay, and then we have this one. Let's come back to that because that's not going to be as. Uh, useful as 
So that's actually it for guitars. You've got those two guitar parts, so the, the, the verse and the chorus. And they're treated fairly similarly, but just like a little bit more um, punch for the, for the chorus. And pretty much that's it for the first verse. That's all that's in. Then when the chorus comes, quite a lot comes in. Then the second verse, the, the main difference is the addition of... This, uh, this, this road, which again has been run through the RC20. It's the same effect really, it's just to try and bring out that middle of it, make it sound a bit more sort of old, sample sound. but it's very slightly off to the right hand side specifically so that when this happens in the in the second verse it can be balanced by the by the the roads being the equivalent to, to the other side the Hammond that comes in. And then the second half, you also have, we have this figure, which is a higher up little roads figure with the same, same effects as the, as the main roads but we've lowered them. The, the guitar comes in louder for the beginning of that uh, verse, but then drops a bit to make, to make way for this to cut through a bit more and to make way for these little organ melodies that come in. Now obviously the big organ chords here. So this is obviously mic'd up with the the um, the Leslie the top of the Leslie in stereo and the bottom in mono, which is how it is on a how it is on a Leslie, um, which really gives you the stereo this amazing stereo spread for the for the for the chorus, and again I added some a bit of Valhalla room onto that. And we've added added the Valhalla room onto that, just enough to give it a bit of space. I'll play that on its own. So the Hammond with just a room on. So it just, just, just sets it a little bit back in the mix again to fill that mid space, not too far back, but enough that it's not um, right in your face then. Okay, also coming in in the chorus here, we have... the sort of basic Rhodes chords, which are just padding out. And then a little extra part here, just to tag. And so all together with all the Rhodes parts, so there's like five Rhodes parts all together. See that in the, the all sort of intertwines with what's happening with the bass. A 
and then padded through, you've got the organ, but also this Mellotron, which really thickens it out. And this, again, it warps it up a bit. It's got a bit, we've decapitated it. Um, See the organs really driving it because that's what's really lifting that, and then that little counter melody, and that's all the instruments in. So it's it's not as you can see it's not a crazily full track. I think that that's something that goes across the whole Arlo Parks record. There's not millions of layers of stuff. So when it comes to mixing. It can actually sometimes be harder to work with less layers because you still want to get dynam sort of dynamics into the track. You want to get movement. You want it to feel like it's progressing. And when you've got less to work with, it can sometimes be harder. It can often be easier when you've got hundreds of tracks to play with because, oh, you want to lift that bit. We can lift these here and what happens there. Obviously, Paul is a real master of arrangements. So you can see he's thought this out. There's enough happening at every stage for it to feel like it's building, like it's working, like it's um, it's not falling flat. It can happen very easily if you're not quite as skilled at arranging stuff together. So, this, so you've got this little tag. Um, and then you've got later on in the track. Well, actually, the, we did do an edit on this track after, after the, when it first came. There was, uh, there was a section that we wanted to sort of double in length. So to do that, it, it was, it just felt like it was so good you needed to have it again. So on this chorus, so then we sort of made a slightly different arrangement. And we did that by just having that Rhodes come in just on that little answer line, not, not just on the whole thing. And then it comes in fully here. So it does still feels like it's building and not just copying the same thing over. So I think when you, that, which is, a, and then we've sort of raised the, we've slightly altered the sound of the Hammond in the second half, so that's raising up as well. So I think that's important, just subtle, if you do find you need to add in extra sections at the mix stage, I think just copying and pasting can sound a bit flat. So you need to add something in that's going to keep audio interest. So it's either like muting something out for the first time or bringing something in or putting something in a different space or treating it differently. Because I think the ear, the ear gets a bit tired if it hears exactly the same thing twice, it switches off. So you've got to make it keep creating that interest, keep creating a build, make something different every time. Okay, so looking at the vocals, um, she's got a brilliant distinctive voice straight off, so that immediately makes it easier to mix. So let's have a listen to the flat vocal. So you can tell it's obviously been recorded on a really brilliant mic because it's sounding good straight away. I mean, the usual issue when I get stuff to mix is that I think people assume that vocals are really easy to record, but they're not. It's a lot of it's about getting the, the right mic, the right distance from the mic. A vocalist understands how to use a mic. And that's part of production as well, is knowing how to explain to a vocalist how to use the mic to get the best sound out of their voice. And just because a mic's posh and expensive doesn't mean it's going to sound good on someone. I've certainly had cases where people have used like immaculate U47s and it's not sounded great on them just because it's an expensive mic. It doesn't mean anything. Sometimes a cheaper mic will sound better on someone. It's, you've, there's no right and wrong to it. It's a matter of the producer really using their ears and whatever she's used here really works. As you can tell, it's got presence. It's not, there's no, there's, she's a little bit close in on it, but that's, that's quite, um, that's to get that warmth. 
into the vocal and you know, obviously we can deal with that really easily straight away. There we are and we've dealt with it just with a really sharp um, high pass filter but it's but it's got that intimacy on the mic which really suits her voice because we want her to be here in the track. So within I really like this feature in the um, the Pro Q3 that you can have little dynamic bands so when it just to hold in these frequencies around here it's just got a bit of that dynamic EQ going on and then just giving a little bit of sort of clarity presence but not top end into the voice and then we're really compressing um, with a fast attack and release. I bought you breakfast, then you start at your rings. The air was fragrant and thick with our silence. I think I tried um, an LA two A, but it wasn't it wasn't really bringing the vocal forward in quite the way I wanted. So this the eleven seventy six was fast enough to sort of give that presence in. It hurts when you see it coming. You're too proud to tell me. Again, here we're really really chopping the low end down and a little bit of a top end so we're not de-essing yet i always leave that to the end but too cool to show it babe you're so good you're too good to be true okay and then um i think you know so we're using a bit of the uh the pull tech eq so there's a little bit of a little bit of boost around 10k so it's just a little bit of presence into the voice with a fairly sharp cue there or a very sharp cue and then rolling off a little bit of this very very top end so just to stop that real sparkle partly to just warm the voice up a bit because it's that sort of more sort of tapey vintage sound on it we're talking of which we've also run it through the studio simulator and you can see it straight away you can see it's just cracking it up a little bit like it's slightly overdriven to tape um, in fact it's like fairly driven into that over still to stop and to show that you can watching you lower both your eyes and just a tiny bit of EQ for correction afterwards and then um, then the ds -er, and I love this ds -er, the, the, um, it's doing quite a lot of work on this so almost we've taken like a nicely recorded vocal and it's roughed it up a bit it's a bit um, you can hear there on its own it's quite it's a little bit overdriven it's a little bit over squashed too cool to show but then when we put it in with the track it sort of fits with what's going on with the drums and the bass so it's got a bit of character there it's it's quite loud we mixed it we've definitely mixed it loud and then probably the key thing is if we look at the automation on the vocal there's a lot so i've gone through pretty much every line and them little volume rides on it sometimes quite a lot so say here you've got to tell me that you can. so that's just to get that presence in because otherwise you could be losing that you can so on the cut of care um so say if we get rid so if i don't don't have that there So it just gets lost a little bit and then we put it back um, back in. Tell me that you can. So it's just got that more, it's really like, because um, there's a drum there as well, you still want it to be the vocal that's leading that. And then often these lifting up these tails of words so that they... Push away. It hurts when you see it come another you has to show you can. So as she goes quieter, you just want to push it so she keeps the, um, the volume on the track. And I know we're compressing, but doing this on top of it allows you to really control every bit, but leave the compression where it's sounding good. And because it's heavily compressed, you've really brought up the breath. So, cool so, 
to, to stop the breath dominating, we've sort of rolled everyone down a little bit. So that's, once I've got to this stage, yeah, I'd, I'd have the music in, I'll be doing this and I'll be, I'll have a pass and then keep refining as I'm listening through as to what, what words aren't coming out, what, what's not having the presence that I want it to. So there's a, the main things, we've got a reverb and a delay. The delay is pretty, is pretty minimal. I bought you breakfast, then you started your rings, the air was fresh. Mute everything, just have the vocal. I bought you breakfast, then you start at your ring. Okay, so this is the, the reverb. Let's, um, I'm going to lift it right up just so we see. There's something deep inside pinched. I touched the bump on your wrist. You were born with. So it's quite a gritty reverb, isn't it? It's like, um, what we've got going on is, again, it's like the space echo. There's no like echo on this. That's off. It's the spring reverb which is then going into a plate as well. So it's a really like bright, trashy reverb sound. It's got spring and plate, which I know is not that conventional to run two reverbs into another. I bought you breakfast, then you started your Quite subtle, the, the spring, that's just a sort of, with our silence. like a halo around the vocal. And then this is the, I held my breath as something deep it's the, the, the plate the is the main, and then just running a bit low end off and taking a bit of the tight top what sparkle off it. Push away. It hurts when you see it coming. You're too proud to tell me that you can. So what we do have here is like a, a track of effects have been printed. Um, which has obviously been automated. We do have another lead vocal track here actually, which is this. Why'd we make the simplest things so hard? But that's the same, same effect, it's the same treatment as this other. I let my pain out through the way that I sit and start to pick at the rim. So yeah, again, it's quite simple on the vocal. It's just like a bit of reverb and the occasional delay coming in on the chorus just to give it, a, especially a, a tail towards the end of the chorus. But what really does lift the chorus is, is these. So you've got, firstly, you've got the I think you know it, too cool to panned like halfway the side. Babe, you're so good. You've got the, um, the doubles, to be true. which again, it's just got a bit of you know low end taken off them. Too cool to show Same babe, sort so of like multi-band and um, DSing, but not the heavy, not the heavy tape distortion or the extra compression, but it's, it's just to widen the vocal out and thicken it at that point. Then there's also, I'm going to look at these next, which are there. Babe, you're so good, you're too good to be true. So you've got your, your harmonies there. So good, you're too good to be true. And then these harmonies as well. Think you know it. Show it. So you add them in. I think you know it. Too cool to show it. So it's quite Maybe subtle harmonies, but it's it's really thickening. True. It's really pop. They're really like well done harmonies. It. Too cool to show it, babe. You're so good. You're too good to be true. Oh, why'd we? So then you've got this little. It's, it's like an extra hook, isn't it, that comes in every now and again there. Oh. Which is, um, it comes in more towards the end as well, in a slower way. But it really, that's like a little device to really lift it. I think you know it, too cool to show it. Babe, you're so good, you're too good to be true. And then when we get to the tag. Oh, why'd we make the Again, we've got the, things we've so got the, um, the doubles. And then. Oh, why'd we make the same? The lower harmony. So 
and then the so hard comes in as a much higher harmony. So you've got it again. It's 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 creating different textures for different things. You've got the higher harmony here, then the lower harmony comes in for the chorus tag, but then you get an extra lift with the third harmony right at the end of that. Again, you can see that we've lifted we've done different, or even though this is the same part coming back here, it's treated differently when we get into this. Okay, so we've just done sort of bits of volume. I've done bits of like volume lifting here towards the end to get stuff to cut through. Because the real dynamic thing that's happening here, especially towards the end, is the organ changes. that see that line you still mean the world to me it comes right down without the harmonies at that point so then it builds again it's clever arrangement on their behalf because it's at that point you'd normally expect to just be building and building but they've dropped the harmonies out which allows them to bring them back in so they gradually come back in again over the next couple of lines so that's um again it's sort of a sort of clever arrangement in terms of subtly changing stuff up and creating dynamic in, in the arrangement to make room for stuff. We'll have a look at the master bus, um, which I've gotten, it's just running through an OGS here with all the master stuff. So let's take it all off to start with. So let's go to the chorus where it's going to be having most effect. So the first thing we're going to add in is the Master Desk Classic, which is mainly just to give it a little bit of drive, mainly to do a bit of stereo enhancement. Tiny bit of distortion on it, again. A B A to just widen slightly and just the distortion brightens it up a little bit. Um, again, a little bit of boost on the low end. I think that would have been when I was just sculpting towards the end. Otherwise, it's fairly flat, like a couple of little things, which would have been just overall tonal shaping when I've listened on different speakers. Got the, SS, the Waves SSL compressor. It's not really hammering looking at that there. It's only going down to about like um, four decibels and a fairly slow attack, but a, a fast release and a, a, just a, a low ratio. But it holds, I love this compressor. It just holds, just glues everything together without being too, um, well, you can make it so it really pumps, but it's enough to just give it a punch. Some compressors seem, seem to make their presence felt a bit more. You hear what it's doing, but it doesn't mess up the sort of tonal balance of the mix. I think the key for me with mix compression is getting your attack and release settings right. Because I think a lot of people assume that it, because it's mix compression and you just want to be stopping overloads that you have to have a fast attack and release. Whereas I don't see it like that at all. I just want it there to help glue and to help um, a, like just the, the feel of the sound of a compressor on the mix. It's more about lifting some of the detail out than it is about stopping those transients. So I always have quite a slow attack, which allows me to have to keep the, the transients happening. Um, especially in the low end, you've got to make sure you don't have too hard an attack, otherwise you just lose all that thump in the mix. So even though you're, you can be compressing quite a bit, but with a slower attack, it's, it's a lot more gentle and you're still getting the transients through. Um, and that's the battle for me, is to be able to get something nice and loud, but with clear transients. And the other way people do that, obviously, and sometimes have to do it, is, is by using, you can get the volume up and the detail up by using layers of distortion or layers of uh, saturation. But I don't always like the sound of that. I actually quite like 
really, especially with electronic music, very clear, clean bass and clean um, sounds with not distortion on everything. It works more for sort of guitar bands, I think, more sort of punky guitar stuff than I think using the way of using more harmonics and distortion works. Um, so when I was mixing the Manic Street Preachers record, there's a lot more of using harmonics and distortion to get some of that detail out. And the compressor was doing a bit less probably on it. But I really like that excitement of a compressor, especially on when you're trying to get like a, a mix to really like move you and to make you move. I like, but, it, but you do have to be fussy about your attack and release settings. I love the, the fab filter stuff. So again, we're just taming the low end. We're holding in that, um, the mids. That looks, yeah, it's a little, it's not, not too fast an attack. And then it's just to hold those peaks again with the vocal and it's jumping out a bit too much. It's just, just holding it. And then we've brightened the whole mix a touch at this point. I must have just felt it was getting a little bit flat with the compression. So just lifted it up again. So this is what would have gone to mastering. It would have gone over to Matt Colton sounding like this. But to send over to label and producers and everyone, because everyone's used to hearing um, uh, a limited version. Oh, my limiter is usually doing about five or six dBs worth of work. I don't really want to be hearing the limiting too much, but I want to be hearing it enough that it, I've got an idea of what the limiting is doing. Occasionally, I know that my limited versions of what's been used on the mastering, maybe they've worked on them. But as a whole, I, I just want it to be, I've, I've used this um, the multiband limiter because I find it a tiny bit more transparent because it's attacking peaks differently. What am I doing here? The, the maximum, yeah, I'm doing like 5 dBs worth of limiting there, which is what I'd expect. So it's just, it's bringing it up enough. I will AB with the, the rough mix so I'm like comparable and if that sounds fairly sensible. This is always a, a tricky thing as a mixer is to decide what level to hand in the listening copies at. Occasionally I'll be sent rough mixes that have been hammered. And to me that's really bad practice because then you're leaving anything a mixer delivers to you after you've handed in a, a super slammed, maximized, like limited to within an inch of its life and distorted mix. Everything's going to sound flat next to it, but that mix isn't going to translate well to radio at all. So you made the, you've immediately made both the mixer's job and the master's job really difficult. It's always good practice to have a rough mix that has a little bit of headroom to it. It doesn't sound so flat that the band are like, well, this track sounds quiet, but it, it doesn't want to be so slammed that it's competing with the loudest masters out there. It needs, it needs to have some dynamic in it and it needs because you know you can have a track it comes in slamming and you're like yeah this is really exciting but then it goes nowhere in the chorus because it's being held in and then you're just letting the limiter do all the work but it makes it very difficult to compare as you put you start the two tracks off and you listen back for say, oh the, the rough mix is way more exciting but it's not overall because it's not going to translate to radio because radio is going to turn that down anyway and the whole thing's going to sound squashed and flat luckily this came in at like a totally sensible level this this rough mix um but it does cause me problems when rough mixes come in to such a crazy loud degree that you just think, well, I can't compete with that. So I usually have to write quite a long email explaining that I've had to, this mix is going to be quieter than your rough mix. So you're going to need to turn your rough mix down 4 dB to have a comparative listen as to what the differences really are. Bear in mind that it's going to be turned down mastering anyway, because you're way over the LUFS limit or Spotify would turn it down or whatever it is. So. I generally aim for handing in a mix when I've got my Luffs meter on as somewhere between minus 11, minus 10, minus 9 maybe. And it also gives the mastering engineer somewhere to go as well, because otherwise you're passing, if, you, if I'm hammering it way too loud this end, then they may need to bring it down in the context of an album and it's, it gives them a bit of a nightmare to do. So at some point it's got to hit a sensible level in terms of loudness. But I do do my final tweaks and adjustments with that limiter on because I want to know that it can go through limiting and come out the other side sounding good. I don't want it to, that once you put limiting on, it becomes a massive shock at mastering. It's like, whoa, okay, well, what's this done to the track? 
I'd rather have it more of a shock the other way around. We take a limiter off and say, okay, well, it doesn't sound quite right now. That's a bit more easy to deal with than the other way around. So I definitely don't want a big shock of when we put limiting on that it's all going to go wrong. And sometimes I'll send both copies. This is the other thing, always send both to mastering. You send your limited version and the unlimited version, because then the mastering engineer knows what everybody signed off on, knows what everybody has approved. Um, and sometimes uh, mastering engineers will ask for my, for my limiting settings so they can replicate it there so they know in the studio what's going on. It's always good to have a good, as a, as a mixer, you definitely need to have a good relationship with the people who are mastering your records. It's, um, if you can find someone you work really well with, it really makes sense to just keep using that person as often as you can, because you can build, they can, you can build up an understanding of what you like, what you do, how you, how you hand your tracks in, how you limit them. So like I use, I use Matt Colton and Heba Kadri loads. They're both amazing. And there's plenty of other amazing mastering engineers out there as well, but they're, they're the two that are my go to and have been for years because I've got a relationship with them where they'll know that I'm very fussy, say, about retaining the transient attack of snares and kicks through the mastering process, whereas maybe some mixers are quite happy for them to be squashed in and that's part of what they're looking for in mastering, whereas I don't I want that to, to be kept intact because I see that as part of the, uh, what I'll, I'll deal with in the mix. And, and then it just makes the process quite a bit easier. Also, Joe Laporta as well in, um, in New York. He's also someone I use quite a bit. And I know from those people, because we've worked with each other enough, what, what's going to come back, really. And it's quite, it's good to have that, those relationships. So, yeah, with multiband on the mix bus, and some people are into it, some are not. I've used it for years and years and years. It's um, been quite a big part of my sound. I find I want it to be, it doesn't go on early in the process, but I put it on afterwards. I like the glue that it provides. So I'm not using it to fix problems. I'm using it to hold things in and create. Um, I like using that as a way to create a glue within the mix or within the various frequency bands. And it'll be to different elements, different levels for different mix. And it's, I'll also automate for certain parts of the song. It's definitely something I use as a standard tool. I've used multiband for years and years and years. I love what it does. It's a very, it's, it's a very sensible approach from what I can see. You can go in and yeah, you can go in and automate everything, but sometimes you just want that glue that it provides. And I know that even before I've switched that on, I'll have got the track sounding in a really good place anyway. And I will have dealt with most of the issues that I want. So I'm not using it as a corrective tool to do the mix for me. I'm using it as a tool to, to glue certain frequencies together in a way that, you know, just as much as using a mix compressor, you could say is cheating on a mix because you have, you could automate everything to do exactly the same. It's just doing exactly the same as a mix compressor, but within various bands so that you're tying stuff in together in a way that's a, a sort of creative glue that you're using on the mix. And you may want certain stuff to, to push through or to gel in a certain way, and you want other stuff to, to, to just sort of um, be pushing each other back and forth, which creates like a bit of dynamic in the mix. And yeah, I don't, on this, it's fairly straight settings, but sometimes there's definitely a mix I've been doing recently. It's just out now, the new track by Spiritualized, where there's loads of various automations on different compressors on the mix, because there were hundreds and hundreds of tracks and all sorts of uh, complexities going on there. And it really worked as the glue to help make the sound really big and feel like it was growing, but without losing the space that we had as well. I think it's important to A-B with the rough mix. You definitely want to make sure you're not making it worse, so you're not um, killing what's there in the song. Um, also to have, to listen to the, I listen to the rough mix a few times before I start and be very critical of it, but also try and work out what it was that they were enjoying about it to 
to put that down as a rough mix. I say, what's good about it? What's bad about it? So I've got a clear idea in my head of what I'm actually going to be doing in the mix. I'm not just forcing it into my style and taking what they've got and finding what's right for that track. Whatever notes have come from the artist beforehand about what they're looking for in the mix. And some people don't want much done at all. Some people are like, look, we don't even like the rough mix of this, so just go for it. Just find a way of making this balance. Some people are very, very attached to the rough mix and be like, don't change any levels, just somehow open it up a bit. So it, it really it really depends. I'll always say my opinion. Um, I have a taste of how I like things balanced. So I'll always go for a rough, the first draft will be, I know there's going to be notes on it, but I always think like, okay, is this a good starting point, basically, is what I'm asking on the first draft, and then we'll get into detail. Because there's no point going into hours and hours and hours of tiny detail if the overall balance isn't in the right direction for what they're after. Although occasionally, you know, just, uh, I know on the Mannix record, there was like a first draft, a couple of first drafts to end up on the, on the record. Because they were just like, okay, don't change anything about this. This is exactly what we're after. Don't, don't touch it now. Whereas other people, there's lots of little back and forth. With this, there's like arrangement things. Um, and just getting, making sure that the backing vocals were in the place that they wanted them to be. And just being open to that as well, and being open to, you know, working with an artist and not, not dictating to an artist. It's definitely the dynamic has got easier having had some success on various projects because maybe people are slightly more inclined to listen to my opinions, but not always, you know, I actually quite like that as well. <laughs> but, um, it's sometimes it'll get to a point where I say, okay, look, I think you want someone different to me than me to do this mix. This is not what I'm going to bring to this is not what you actually want. You need to do, you need to find the right person. And you just got to have, you know, not be so ego driven that you can say that, you know, it's not, you don't have to, sometimes it's just not going to work out. And that's totally fine. There's no reflection on your work or their work or their choices or your choices. It's just sometimes it's not the right match. And that's fine. Um, so that does happen occasionally. Especially if I'm un if I'm unsure that it's a good match, I'll always suggest to the artist, okay, well, let's not, not commit to a whole album. Let's just do one track and let, let's see where we go with it. Because I'll sometimes I'll just get a hunch that okay, this isn't going to maybe be the best combination, but I'll try it because I'd like to work on this music. And if you like what I bring to it, that's great. But sometimes. You know, you're not going to, so like with the, the Manic Street Preachers, they sent me one track and they were just like, look, can you just try something and then we'll see if it's going to work. And luckily they loved it. So it's like, okay, we'll do the whole album then. And it was a nice straightforward process. But occasionally it doesn't, it doesn't work out. And so, and occasionally bands will send tracks out to three or four mixers at once. And you know that that's the case. Because different people are going to bring different things. And it's not a reflection on anybody. You know, maybe I'll get the job, maybe someone else will get the job. There's no reflection on anybody as to what, how good their work is. It's just what the band is feeling. It's an artistic decision. It's not, um, it's not a comment on how good your work is or how good you are as a mixer. It's just whether what you're bringing to the project is right for what the artist wants. It's, um, you have to sort of take ego out of it, really. Um, and you have to be open to working with an artist. An artist will have comments and sometimes even if I disagree, if I, if, if I strongly disagree with an artist's, so we may be really close, say, with, a, with coming to an end of a mix and they want to do something to it. Even if I disagree, I won't refuse to do it. I'll say my opinion and why I think something, but I'll still do it and we'll listen to both and then try and discuss and figure out what's right and wrong about it. But just dismissing someone's ideas without even trying them is, seems a bit counterproductive to me. That's, that's, that's then about ego, and that's not really helpful. I think an artist should always be allowed to hear what they want to achieve, um, because sometimes they won't even like it anyway. But to, and I've definitely heard of mix engineers refusing to do stuff. I just think, well, why? And it's, what, what's it matter? Try it. You can always take your name off. You can always say, no, this is like, you know, there's always, but it's an artist's record. It's not the mixer's record. It's an artist's record at the end of the day. They have to be the ones happy with it. If I really 
don't feel it's working, then I will suggest that maybe they'll find you know someone else that's better suited to what they want, you know, and that it's not on any you know bad feelings or anything like that. But and occasionally an artist will choose that. But it's like both of the situations are rare, and you always get there with an artist where we make a record that sounds really good that's also got what they are after in it. Um, because I'm not stuck to one type of sound. For example, like the spiritualized record that I just mixed, it doesn't sound like any other record I've mixed. It's got a very different tonal balance to what I would normally go for. Jason, who's an amazing, brilliant musician and producer, and um, he hates hearing any sub bass in a kick drum. He wants the kicks to be very, to be sound like, like a, an actual small kick drum on the other side of the room. That's not how I mix on like a kick ever. But I was quite intrigued to take this approach. He's like, oh, look, the records I really like. He likes these very sort of 60s garage records, which don't really have the sub bass in them. And I love those records too. And I was like, oh, okay, well, let's, let's find a way of making this balance work and get this vision happening with a, where I'm sort of almost a bit uncomfortable with the, with the tonal balance, but I think, well, let's make it work like that. And you, that's how you learn. I don't want to be stuck into one way of working. I want to experiment with different ways of working, different um, techniques and not just be stuck into, okay, I do this, I have this bass level, I have this high level, is it? Like, and if you don't want that, you can go somewhere else. I want to try different things myself. And as long as it excites me and it sounds good, that's, that's what matters. It's hard to know when things are finished, but I do, I usually have like, I go through my process, I get, I get it to a point where I put it on a loop and I just keep listening and stuff will start to bug me after a bit. So I go through that process before the first draft. So I've got, I've dealt with the stuff that's bugging me, that's getting in my way, that's, I'll listen on a couple of different systems, I'll sit in different places in the room. It's easier when you're a bit further down an album. The first track, first couple of tracks on the album are harder because you're still setting the parameters. Once you've got tracks signed off, then you've got something to compare it to. Well, maybe A, B with that track. Does it sit on the record with that track? Well, yeah, it does. And so we're probably in a better place. Um, so it gets faster as the record goes on that process and you know you know where you're heading to if it's a first draft and it gets signed off i just guess um i'll i'll listen and if there's anything that's really bugging me i'll say actually having listened i'd like to change this thing you just have an instinct after a while that when something's finished it's, it's got to be moving you and music's about emotion and about feelings not about the technicality of it. It's in that emotion or it's making you dance or it's doing doing what it's setting out to do, then usually that's the right place with it. Well, thank you for watching this Mix with Masters video. Um, there are a couple of other videos I've done um, in the past that are still up on the platform, one for Blossoms and one for my own project audiobooks, which have quite different approaches to this um, track. And so definitely check those out as well. Um, and thank you for watching.